Hey, how you doing? My name is Pastor Yaku Shell. I'm the senior pastor of Hand of the Lord International. And we're going to continue on our series, First Fruits. Uh, we left off on last week at 1 Samuel 18, around verse 15. So we're just going to pick right up in verse 16. Verse 16 declares, it says, But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. And so you got to understand as we are continuing on this, that when you are going to the next level and, you, and God is taking you to a place of increase, as we have established the fact that when we're dealing with first fruit, we're talking about increase. And so now you got to understand in verse 16, uh, help us to see that you got to be able to know how it feels to be hated and loved at the same time. I think God allows both to take place to keep us at a place of humility. And verse 17 says, and Saul said to David, behold, my elder daughter, Merah, her will I give to thee to wife. He's talking to David. Only be thou vigilant for me and fight the Lord's battle for Saul said, let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. Notice that Saul dangled his daughter in front of David. But the truth of the matter, he wanted to use David's desire to be with his daughter to now put David in a situation whereby Saul was going to use the Philistines to do his dirty work. Many times as you're wrestling, uh, moving to the next place, and, and, and you begin to sense warfare hitting you. Uh, let me give you an example of what, what that is. When you are becoming more sensitive in the spirit realm, when warfare begins to hit you, you kind of feel kind of tilted. You kind of feel off. That's why it's important that you take care of your body because you're able to identify the difference in you just having a sickness and the fact that there's warfare coming against you. And so you, you find yourself kind of off. You can't really quite pinpoint what's going on with you and that's because there's warfare that you're facing but here's the, the thing that makes it difficult many times we want to take the first thing that we see and say well this is what the enemy is fighting me with this is where my enemy is coming from but you got to understand that part of the tactics of the enemy is to get you fighting something that's really not your enemy not to say that it's not your enemy rephrase that but it may not be the, the bulk of where the warfare is coming from so notice that Saul it was him that was hating on David, but he said, I'm going to use the Philistines to do my dirty work. And so you have to be careful. And, and the main way that I see this taking place is when a person takes on another person's offense. In other words, that you have a situation where someone is, 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 is being used by the enemy to come against you. Instead of them coming to you about what they don't like and address their issues, they entail go to someone else. And then they, they begin to talk about what they don't like about you. That same energy could be used to them, with them talking to you one on one. But instead they don't do that which points to the fact that they are being motivated by the enemy's warfare and so what happens is that a person takes on another person's offense and then the enemy use them to go and do their dirty work so they go to you tell you what they don't like about a person what needs to change that same energy that they're using to talk to you they could be going to that person but instead they don't you take on their offense and all of a sudden now you're more mad at that individual than the person that came to you and here's what the enemy uses. And that's just a tactic of the enemy. So somebody could come to you, and, 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 and here's what I've also seen. They get that person stirred up. Now that person feels the need to speak on behalf of the, the masses or the them. You're going to see that it's going to be where they feel or, or, you know, people feel, you know, or it's been said. They don't tell you exactly where it's coming from. That's a tactic of the enemy. And so now here is Saul saying, I'm going to use the Philistines to do my dirty work. It, I don't want to go against David one-on-one. -on -one. I can't uh, defeat him or he, he knows that God is with him. Remember, he has already thrown a javelin at David at more than one occasion. He says, I'm going to use the Philistine. But here's what David did in verse 18. The Bible says that David said unto Saul, who am I? Watch this. This is key. He says, who am I? For what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? This is the kicker. Now, we, when we move into this next place, and we're still talking about first fruit and God with our attitude. Earlier this week, my wife asked the question, how do you uh, allow God to grow you, elevate you, but you still remain humble? I believe this is the key. And this is the key is, in this verse, it shows us the, the, the dynamics of pride versus humility. I think the key is gratitude affects my attitude. Let me, let me say that again. Gratitude affects my attitude. Now, here's the thing what David shows us at this next level. David shows us, here's what I need to do. I need to be grateful for my opportunity. And, and this is so amazing. My heart is about to explode right now just thinking about this. That David is so caught up in being grateful that he is not 
worried about the other stuff that's going on. The most important thing that's happening with David is that he's checking his attitude and he's saying, I am, who am I that this should, I should be even in this position? This is totally polar opposite from those who feel as though they are entitled. Entitlement is increased, brought into your life without any accountability. That breeds entitlement. Entitlement, I'm sorry. So in other words, you think that I'm owed this. Watch this. Here's where a lot of people mess up in this, that they cannot appreciate the opportunity that God brings them to because they're, they're too caught up on the manifestation of the opportunity. And here's what I mean by that. So God brings you up to an opportunity. You can't be grateful for the opportunity because you, you're not thankful for the opportunity. You're more concerned, with, but it hasn't manifest yet. So you cannot see that who are you in a way that he's even providing you an opportunity. You're just looking at the fact that, but it hasn't manifested. So, so I'm still mad. I'm still groping. I'm still complaining. My attitude is off because I cannot appreciate the opportunity because I'm still worried about the manifestation of the opportunity. But here's what, if you look at David, here's what I think happens with David. The more and more I think about this, here's what I think happens with David. If you study the life of David, you will see that he makes the, the, the declaration in Psalms that he was conceived in sin. If you study his life, many theologians believe that Jesse is David's da dad, but we do not hear about David's mom. So some believe that David is now raised by his father, but he's not raised by his mother. That his brothers who come from another mother is the one who's raising him. Henceforth, could you imagine David being the youngest of all the, his siblings, but he is being raised by his father but his biological mother is not in the picture so the mother that is in his life belongs to his brothers so could you imagine now Jesse is forced to raise David David is in a household that now every time he goes before another lady he's a reminder of the fact that Jesse cheated on her so you could imagine she's not going to treat David like she's treating the other her other sons, her biological kids. So could you imagine they sitting at the dinner table, everybody get a portion of their, their food. David ends up with the smallest portion. And the reason she gives David the smaller portion is because she really don't like him. And, 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 but she masks it as in, well, I don't want David wasting his food. So if he brings up to his dad, but dad, she's not giving me enough to eat. And Jesse says, well, yeah, I, I noticed that. But she said that she don't want you to waste your food because you, you just waste your stuff and you're the youngest. But the truth of the matter, she's motivated by the fact that David is a reminder that her husband stepped out on, on, on her. And now she's forced to raise somebody that really don't belong. And many of you don't understand that, that sometimes God will allow you to go through those seasons where you're hated outside of your control to actually develop gratitude in you. And no matter how much I'm talking about this gratitude piece, here's what I recognize. At the end of, of this message, I could pray for you. But the truth of the matter, no one can give you gratitude. Gratitude has to come from you. You have to be appreciative to what God is doing in your life. And so what I'm, what I'm recognizing and looking at David, David says, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? He said, here it is that, that Saul has just said, there's an opportunity that I can be the king's son-in-law. When he remembers what it's like to be conceived in sin, raised by a woman that's not his mother, his brothers don't care for him. They, when he goes to try to save them, they say, who you think you are? So no matter what David tries to do, he is never enough. And some of you are in that position. Matter of fact, I interceded for you on my way here, and God began to drop this on me, and I want to pray for, pray for you. Those of you who are, are facing this, this rejection piece, that for whatever reason, no matter what you try to do, it just seems like people just don't like you. No matter how nice you try to be to whoever, they, they, they just don't feel you. They're not allowing you in like you think. No matter how well you try to act as being a girlfriend, it seems like you'll never be a wife. No matter how well you try to be the boyfriend, it seems like you'll never be the husband. It, it just seems like things are always evading you and you can't quite put your finger on it. Here's the thing that, that you got to look at. Let's use David life as an example. First thing that we got to do with attitude, quit complaining about the process. Could it be that, they, that God knew that he was going to make David king? But it did not start out with everybody praising David, and that's where we mess up. We, wanna, we want praise along the way to kingship, but not understanding that sometimes gratitude is put inside of your heart by there's some type of lack. So some of us know what it's like, and I would say this to myself, that growing up not having a father aided in me appreciating God as being my father. 
So sometimes you, you have yourself, you find yourself lacking something, and once you finally get the taste of it, you appreciate it more than a person who's already had it their whole life. I see that with, with, with my kids, that, that they've, all they've known is me being around. And so there seems a greater gratitude when their friends come over, come around, and they don't have their father in the picture. And so they are able to appreciate what they have all the time because of the lack that they did not have. And so sa sadly to say, that's, that's how many of us are. If we were to uh be put it out put it out there we say no that's not how i am but the truth of the matter sometimes if you grew up around something all the time that becomes your norm and it takes someone else who did not grow up in that situation to come back and help you to see man you you bless that I, and as I was thinking about this, uh, the Holy Spirit started dropping in my heart that those of you have seen other people in their life and it seems as though they had more than you and you've envied other people. You can't appreciate your opportunity because you've always looked at somebody else feeling that you have always received the short end of the stick. My mind goes to a, a young lady that, that I was told about and we also deal with sexual abuse. And the young lady was being abused while she was in elementary school. But, but in elementary school, she would always come to school with $20, $30, $40. And if you give a, a fifth grader, a sixth grader, $20, $30 a week, that's a whole lot of money. And you can have somebody who is envying her saying she always got money. She always got the new Jordan. She always got the latest this. She always got the latest that. And you look at your situation saying, but they won't buy me anything new. They, 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 how I grew up, you got something new at the beginning of school and you had to, that had to sustain you until tax time. So you only went shopping maybe twice. But you had this person that when the latest comes out, they get it and now you're envying them. But, but, but what if their situation was the reason she had money? was because her, her stepfather was molesting her and the money that you was envious of was really hush money. Would you really trade that? That you got the new Jordans at the expense of your innocence being taken away from you? My point is this. Before you look at somebody else and want their life, you, need to, you don't understand what they've been through. And so you got to be careful when you find yourself jealous and envious of somebody, not knowing how do they go about getting it. And see, this is the, the difference. You, you cannot be grateful for where you are. Your attitude is not a, that of great, a gratitude it, because you're looking at an opportunity and you're so caught up in the manifestation that you can't even appreciate the opportunity. And so you complain along the whole way because you're, you're at discomfort. So, so you put a resume in and you wait on them to call you back. And the whole time you're sabotaging the next level because they haven't called you back and you're inconvenienced. And here's the thing, but, but 10 years ago, you didn't even qualify. So you can't even be thankful for the fact that you qualify because you, you're still waiting on the manifestation instead of appreciating God for the opportunity. You put in for a house and, and now the lender call you back and tell you that you need some more paperwork or, or you got to deal with this derogatory situation on your credit. And so the moment you hang up the phone, you call your spouse or call the people that you're saying you want to pray for you. And, and you're saying, look at the devil. The devil, I can't even get this. They want me to get, I don't have that money to do X. I don't have this, I don't have. Be quiet. Shut up. Why are you not just thankful that you're in a position to even go and apply for a home? You're in a position that you even go to apply for a car. You, 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 you can't even thank God for the opportunity because you're too caught up in the manifestation. David has not become the king's son-in-law. He is in awe with simply the opportunity. The things that he went without, the people that did not love on him like he wanted to be loved, the people who did, treated him bad, all of this stuff is, come, is coming up right now. And because he had been through all those things, he's saying, hey, man, who am I that, that I would even be put in a position to be the king's son-in-law? That you, you got to remember, we, we talked about how David was just now being introduced to the palace. You know what David is looking at? Man, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around being in the palace. And here it is Saul saying, I can marry his daughter. Who am I that I would even have this opportunity? See, sometimes I recognize that many times we in a society that everybody feel the need to uh, make it happen for themselves. And, and, that, and I'm not, I def, definitely won't promote you being lazy. But one of the things that, that I recognize as well, there are some aspects in your life that you can't try to open that door. You got to let God open that door. And see, if you try to open all the doors in your life, the thing is you got to hold that door open. 
See, many times we can't appreciate this piece right here because we're trying to be the ones to make the phone call. We're trying to be the ones to make this happen and to make that happen and make this happen, make that happen. And you don't, at times, you got to step back and let God elevate you on his timing. See, when God elevates you on his timing, then he knows that you're ready. And so here's the thing, that when you, when you don't allow God to work in you first before promotion comes, you, you begin to get out of place. And, and, and you can respect all people, but I, I, I don't agree with worshiping folks or idolizing them. That if God sends you somebody right now that, make, that makes a million dollars or is considered a millionaire, you'll go crazy. Now, you can't wait to take a picture with them to have some sense of identity for yourself because you can't appreciate what God has already done in, in you. Now, I believe that God uses individuals to get us to the next level but I believe that the greatest person you could ever meet is Christ so it doesn't matter what a person bank account says they're not gonna make me it doesn't it doesn't matter what invite I go to or how large the church is I'm asked to speak at I'm not gonna idolize the pastor no matter how well they're known I, I, I don't care who I'm gonna have lunch with I'm not gonna idolize them and the reason being the greatest person I can ever meet is Christ so I'm not a person who is starstruck I don't need to take a picture with you to give validation to me you may need to take a picture with me and I'm not talking about being arrogant. My motivation is this. I'm so appreciative of God and what he has done in my life because I look over my life and, and no matter what happens every day, no matter what, what goes on with me, I'm mindful of the fact that at one point I wasn't even considered. My life did not put me in a situation to even be considered. So if I'm being considered now, I recognize it's not just me. Though I am appreciative of what God is doing, I recognize that it's his hand on my life. You should be in a position right now that God is opening some doors. And the truth of the matter, you really feel inadequate going through the door, but you're willing to go through the door because you recognize it's a door that God has opened. Now, and you should also recognize that his grace is on you. What God is want us to do, when you have gratitude that affects your atti attitude, you're, you're, you're more concerned about it's the God that got me there. And if you know it's the God that got you there, what would keep you from seeking him every day? See, I can tell by, by watching you wake up in the morning, go out the door, who you, who you really depend on to make things happen. Some of you, you don't pray until you run into a situation. But those that have been broken, you don't do anything without seeking the face of God. Why? Because you understand it's his grace and his mercy. You understand that, it's, that, that what's on the inside of me gets unlocked through my relationship and intimacy with the Holy Spirit. So before you try to get in touch with a human, you get in touch with God. And so you spend time in his presence before the day starts. So if you get a, a message that could change your life in the good, you're thankful. If you get a message that, that, that now brings tears to your eyes, you still say, God, I, I thank you. Why? Because it's in him that you live, move and have your being and so God is doing that in somebody's heart right now he's getting you to the place that you're able to be appreciative for the opportunity and not allow the lack of manifestation to cause your attitude to go sour what is it that you're waiting on God to do here's the thing before you allow the enemy to rob you because of your bad attitude and, and now you're speaking against what God want to do think about who are you anyway who are you anyway now I'm not saying that you think less of yourself that, that's what I'm not saying that at all. I don't want anyone to take that. But what I want you to understand is there should be some gratitude that God just gave you the opportunity. In other words, that when you do meet the person who may be influential, you're not in awe that you met them. You're not in awe that they call you back. You're in awe that God would just give you the opportunity. So, Lord, no matter what happens out of this, you are the one that got me here. So I don't have to sleep with somebody to get a promotion because it's God that got me here. I don't have to lie to get in this door. It's God that got me here. I don't have to get outside the character of God that he's been working on me for the last five years. Because at the end of the day, if you tell me no, there's somebody that will tell me yes. And all things work together for the good to them that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. So even if I have a situation that I don't like in my flesh, it's still being used to work his purpose in my life. And it's, the Bible declares in verse 19, but it came to pass at the time when Mary, uh, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David. Look what happened, that she was given over to Ari. Now, this is the first time that they was on the verge of marrying Saul's daughter, but she's given away to somebody else. So could it be <laughs> that part of your elevation is you thinking that I'm going to get this and the thing that you thought was yours that you named and claimed you find out that it's been given to somebody else <laughs> it's nothing like uh, uh believing God for something and you you know you don't lay hands on it you don't throw some oil on it y'all don't walk around it seven times and only to find out that that they accepted another offer than your offer what's your attitude <laughs> 
What's your attitude that you, you told somebody that you had a dream about it and, and God showed you that it was going to be yours and, and, and now you done posted it, you done took pictures on it and the very thing that you thought was going to be yours, somebody else has. What's your attitude? What's your attitude that you, you, you said this was going to be my husband, this was going to be my wife, only to find out that now they finna marry somebody else? What's your attitude? The thing that you thought was going to be yours now has it been given to someone else. Is it the devil or is it you being tried? Is it the whole time that when you thought it was going to be yours, God knew it wasn't? And you had to face some sense of disappointment that he can develop gratitude in you? See, that's somebody that's listening to me now. That's where you are. See, it, had God did it the first time, you would have taken credit for where you are. But God allowed you to do all these wonderful things only to end up with nothing. <laughs> you thought that if you just act like the great wife, you was going to end up being one. And you did all the wifely things. And now they're marrying someone else who hadn't done half of the stuff that you did. And now you want to hate them. Uh, it's part of the growth process. You, you did all you did at the job, and you showed them, I'm qualified. <laughs> so much so that they brought in someone else for you to train them, only for them to get the job, the one you trained. So if I'm qualified enough to train you for the job, I should be the one who get the job, but you're training someone to get the job that you would love to have, and they told you, I just need you to show them a few things that you, you showed them. And now the person you train is telling you what to do. What, what's your attitude? <laughs> the thing that you thought was yours. Here's the thing. I'm not asking you not to feel bad because the Bible says hope deferred make the heart sick. So any, anytime we set our hopes after something and don't get it, it's going to affect us. Here's what I'm asking you to do, though. What you going to do with feeling bad? Are you going to walk in with the right attitude? Are you going to keep seeking God? Lord, I need you to help me right now because I feel like they did me wrong. I need you to help me with this situation because I don't want to see any pictures relate. Uh, don't, don't block him. <laughs> don't block her. Keep looking at their page. You, you the one being tested. You the one being tried. Just like I shared on this past Wednesday and, and, and uh, AP said, you know, clarify. You, sometimes you have to go through things with people so you can end up with a new thing. So when I was talking about a new thing, so I had to go through stuff with my wife, not so I trade her out for someone else. No, so I can have a new wife. So after the thing that we, we go through, she ends up growing, and now God presents a new wife to me. The same woman, but she comes back better. Why? Because we went through something. I, I, I'm being presented as a better husband than I was six months ago. Why? Because we went through something. And, and, and many of you are, are going through trials, and you're facing things right now. And so God, y'all was ripping and running so much that, that God can get y'all by y'all but now you can't go to work he can't go to work y'all got no other choice but to look at each other <laughs> see you had eight hours to ten hours that you can avoid each other but now y'all got to sit at home it's amazing that you was talking about the teachers treating your child wrong but now your child is at home with you all day and you trying to teach them the stuff and you and you recognize it ain't the teacher it's, it's my child just not paying attention they not listening they not doing their work and, and and it's amazing how we can we can come up with stuff until now he put us as Ezekiel said, I sat where they sat. There's some relationships that was on the, on the rocks. And you thought, how could we barely make it? Now you're having to learn how to spend quality time with each other. The truth of the matter is, uh, if you study history, anytime there was a financial crisis uh, and people had to be shut in and people went through financial hardships, here's what ended up coming out of it, 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 a bunch of babies. That's how the baby boomers came about because the Great Depression was going on and people now was out of work. And so now, guess what? When they, by the time they started working, the, the, the wives was coming out pregnant. So I believe that in this same motive, you got people who wouldn't touch each other. But y'all ain't got no other choice but to touch each other. And so uh, we're going to hear some expectancies uh, coming along and, and around Christmas and begin the new year. People are going to be dropping uh, babies that was uh, conceived during the coronavirus pandemic God know what it takes to bring your relationship together and many times we want to run from hardships but the truth of the matter I'm not working you're not working 
can we get creative enough to go down and file the paperwork necessary? I may have to file for unemployment. We may have to file for food stamps. Whatever it is that we need to do, here's the, here's the, here's the thing that's amazing. What if you have to do that for the next 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, and then all of a sudden God blesses your life in 90 days? And, and here's the thing. Here's what your testimony. I went from rags to riches. I, we, we had just filed for food stamps because we didn't know what was going to happen. And all of a sudden this, this other thing over here opened up, and we didn't have to stay on it long. But what, you know what we recognized? We recognized that once the increase came, a lot of stuff that we said we need, we really didn't need. You, when the increase came, instead of us focusing on ourselves, you know, we, we thought about who, who can we help, who could we be a blessing, that God has done something in our, in our life, but we only had to stay on the food stamp for 30 days. Somebody else needed to be on it for the next three years. Lord, use me because we know what it feels like. See, some of you, God is trying to birth another level of ministry out of you, but, but he cannot birth the level of ministry because there's no misery inside of your life. See, sometimes you have to go through misery to birth your ministry. You got to go through pain to birth purpose. Everybody's being tried right now. What are you going to do during this season of testing? What are you going to do during this season of trying? The Bible declares that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Here's what's amazing. Verse 21 says, and Saul said, I would give him her, watch this, that she may be a snare to him. And that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law and one of the twine. Here's something that's scary. What was going on in Michael's life that Saul said, If I give her to David, she's going to be a snare. And I think that Saul knew that his daughter was crazy. I think that Saul knew that his daughter was similar to him. I think that Michael got on Saul nerves, so he knew she would get on David nerve. Here's the crazy part. Look at the dynamic in this. But the crazy part was the first, it didn't say that the first daughter loved David, but she did. So here you have a woman that loved him, but the same woman that loves him can be a thorn to him, a snare to him. <laughs> part of your growth is this. You got to have somebody in your life that say that they love you, but they cause more pain than promise. If you love me, why would you treat me this way? Girl, you can't tell me I don't love you. But if you love me, why are you calling me out my name? If you love me, why are you che still cheating? If you love me, why are you sneaking and having conversations with other people? If you love me, why are you not supportive? Part of your development and growth is you got to have a person that says that they love you in, your, in life, but you look at their actions and it does not meet what that declaration is. Pastor Shelly, you on point. Yeah, I'm on point because I'm trying to tell you they not the one on trial. You are. If you're going to allow God to be the first fruit, use you as the first fruit offering, you got to know what it's like to be around someone that tells the public that they love you. But privately, you question it. <laughs> you got to know what it feels like to have uh, that person to make that declaration around you. In other words, he, he, you know, I love analogies. In public, they hug on you. They speak well of you. Uh, they're more open to tell somebody else how appreciative they are, but they don't tell you. They uh, hold your hand in public but won't touch you in private. They are more concerned with the, the appearance of looking like we're okay than to really be okay. That's part of your development, part of my development. You need to see who's in my life that say that they love me. But their actions don't meet. Here's what's scary. I'm not saying that that person is a demon. What I am telling you is this. A person could really feel that they do love you but don't know how to carry it out. A person can say they love you but don't know how to carry it out. That's scary, right? They can say that they love you but they can't stop being selfish. And when they have the opportunity to love, because love is concerned about the other person, which is the opposite of lust. Lust is concerned about self. They say they love you, but every chance they get, they're lustful. In other words, they're going to think about themselves. And you always are afterthought. And so if you say you share with your stuff, but they won't share with you. you if you go to the store, you think about them, but they go to the store and think about themselves. You do things Thinking about the both of you, they do things thinking about themselves. But they'll tell you, but I love you. They don't know how to show it. 
Um, see, the more that you mature, other things start mattering to you, to you than things that didn't matter before. And to me, a, a, a deal breaker is selfishness. Because I'm a giver. I'm a giver by nature. It's, it's a lot of, most of the stuff I do in my life, I do with other people in mind. There are things that I go without so that somebody else can have. There's fears that, I, fears that I have to face so that somebody else can overcome. And so I recognize as part of the grace that's on my life to do it. But, but I'm human as well. So there are times I want somebody to do for me. I want somebody to put me first. There's times I want someone to care for me or exemplify the love that you say you, 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 you show. But, but when it comes time for them to give back, it turns to be about them again. And if you continue the story, you'll see that this new wife of David was that way. 22 says, and Saul commanded his servant, saying, commune with David. Watch this. Commune with David secretly and say, behold, the king have delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servant spake those words in the ears of David. Watch this, guys. And David said, I'm in verse 23, seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, on this manner spake David. Uh, part of the next level is this. Some conversations are set to set you up. In other words, people will bring you something that somebody else said just to see what your response. And many of you fail the test. <laughs> you, you don't even know you're being set up in the conversation. Now people can record conversations. Now uh, People can, you know, when I was uh, young and some of you not familiar with this, in order to catch somebody in something, we had to put people on, on three-way. And so in other words, I would call somebody, then we would be on the phone, then I would click over, call someone else. And then the person who was on the phone with me at the beginning, I told them don't say anything, and they would not say nothing as I grill the, the, the person who we called later about what they felt about the person I currently was on the phone with. And so we would try to trap a person like that. The downside would be that I remember one particular time that as we were on a three-way, their, their parents picked up the, the, the phone in the other room and, and began to talk. And so now everybody's hanging up real quick because you've been caught. See, see, that was, you know, that was then. We had to do, set people up that way. But now a person can record your conversation. You don't even know you've been recorded. Somebody can be asking you leading stuff just to get you to say something. Watch this. And go back back and say what you said <laughs> here's the thing I'm not asking you to be paranoid I'm not asking you to walk around and you're cautious of every this but what I'm asking you is this out the abundance of the heart the mouth speak if you get your heart flushed out you don't have to worry about saying inappropriate stuff so instead of worrying about somebody setting you up, worrying about you setting yourself up. In other words let me bring to God all of my concerns all of my issues because here's the thing a person will get you wrapped up into a conversation, lead you, give you leading stuff. You begin to talk. Watch this. You know what happened? And when they get back to Saul, they don't say what they said. They just say what you said. They can feel the same way you feel, but it sounds better saying it came from you. And so now they say, well, how do you feel about this? Be careful of that. Well, what you think about this? Be careful of that. Here's, here's what I dare you do. What you think about it? You know, I just think that they should do so-and-so and so-and-so. What you think? You know what? I don't know enough about it to make a comment. And internally, you really feel some kind of way. But you, you don't know if this thing going to get back out. And so you say, well, you know what, man? Why don't you go to them? Why don't you talk to them about it? You say, you know what? You know, I, I feel you. I can see why you feel that way. But, but since, because I don't know everything yet, let, I'm going to wait before I give my comment because I don't want to sabotage my next level through my immaturity. I dare you. I dare you. I dare you go that route. I dare you go that route. Because now when they go back to Saul, and I said this before, here's the thing. Never say anything anything that can't get back to Saul you know what also I see seem that's funny people will have these type of conversations and then the moment it gets back to Saul they get mad at Saul's servants for taking the conversation back to Saul instead of getting mad at yourself but but did they lie on you did you not say that here's the thing <laughs> whatever it is that you say the Bible says that we're held accountable for we had held accountable if we say it in secret and we say it in publicly. We are held accountable for what we say. So don't say anything that you can't afford it to get back to Saul. So you go to, to the job, 
You don't like your supervisor, everybody in the break room talking about them, and they ask you what you think, and you turn that into a vent session, and then they go back and tell your supervisor what you said. And now your defense is, but they said it too, instead of your defense being, that's not true. I didn't say that. I'm being lied on. Let's bring that third party in. That piece is not there because you got entangled. Look what David says. He's saying the same thing that he said before. When they brought to him and said, you know what, Saul, like you. Lie. He wants you to be his son-in-law. Here's what David said. Seemeth it a light thing to you to be the king's son? He, in other words, David said, y'all, y'all just casually throwing this stuff around like it don't mean nothing. David says, I am a poor man. Here's what's amazing and lightly esteemed. What David just said about himself no longer exists. David is not poor anymore. Remember, he's now dressing like Jonathan. He's not lightly esteemed because now he has went up in rank inside of the army. And the Bible already declares, as we start out in verse 16, that the people love David. So what David said is not true. Or is it? Here's what I would tie this to. You remember when Saul messed up and God told Sam, told Sammy to tell Saul this? God says, Saul, your biggest mistake was when, when you were small in your own sight, I could do something with you. There's some people that's watching me now. Here's the thing. The, the problem is you're, you're no longer small in your own sight. You, you feel entitled. You, you're upset now with certain things that are not happening. You feel entitled that God should be doing more than what you feel he's doing. You want to know why you feel entitled? You feel entitled because you see yourself as this wonder. You see yourself as being great. The Bible never tells a person that there directly you're great. He said, I will make your name great. He said, I will, your gift will bring you before great men. So notice he always used greatness as something that's not on me but kind of away from me. Why did he, he, he do that? I believe he does that to bring us to this place of humility. When we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, he tells the children of Israel that I took you through the, through the wilderness to humble you. When we look at the context of humble, in that text, humble means to be dependent upon God. It's not a demeanor. It's not me being quiet. Though I could be those things, but when he says humble, he's saying you, reckon, you recognize that everything that you got going on in your life comes from me. God is trying to do that inside of somebody's heart. See, the reason they could not trap David, even though they gave him what looks like this great promotion, is because internally we recognize where David was. How do we know? By what he said. He says, I'm a poor man. I'm lightly esteemed. But David, that's not happening external. But internal, David is controlling his pride by humility through gratitude. Gratitude is affecting his attitude. He's not getting caught up in the hype with everybody telling him how great he is. And, and here's the thing that you got to do, ladies and gentlemen. You have to be able to handle the applause. When people tell you how great you are, it's up to you how you receive that. Here's the first thing I want to tell you. You got to stay before God because if you stay before God, you know what you're going to find out. God is greater than you. So he's always going to put you at a place of humility that you recognize. I can't get this thing done without you, Lord. And here's where David is. David is saying, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around being here. I'm trying to wrap my mind around being at the palace. I'm trying to wrap my mind around being over these men. And here it is. Watch this. Saul is giving me another great responsibility. David is worried about messing it up. Not to the point that it's causing him to withdraw. His fear of messing up is causing him to run to God even more. And say, as they're bringing him this news, he said, man, y'all act like this is a light thing. Wherever it is that God is taking you next, it shouldn't be a light thing. And I'm not telling you it should keep you up at night. I'm not telling you to get before people who you feel are at a greater status than you and you come in with this type of arrogance about yourself. You should be confident. Watch this. Not in your gift. You should be confident. Not in your attire. You should be confident. Not in what you're driving, where you live now. You should be confident in the fact that it is God who has who's graced you to do the things that you're doing. It's nothing like having a person who wants something too fast. It breeds arrogance. You know, you've seen it, that they can't appreciate what God is doing in their life because they are waiting on a manifestation. Somebody done told you you could sing, and so you can't appreciate being in the background in the choir, on the praise team. Your motivation is, well, when are they going to give me a solo? First thing I want to ask you, what makes you feel like they have to give you a solo? It's called entitlement. 
you're thinking that you're somewhere that you're not. Just because someone else sings and they make it look easy doesn't mean it's easy. And so now here's the crazy part. You can't even do your job because you're waiting for the, for the spotlight to be on you. And here, Lord forbid, they give you an opportunity. Have you ever seen whereby people are more faithful when it's their turn than when they need to be the support system? I've seen it. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I've seen people who, who would get to church late if they even come at all. But if you give them an opportunity to teach a lesson, they on time. They got makeup on. They got a suit on. They got a tie on. And matter of fact, watch this. They've invited other people to come and hear them. But they won't invite them to come to church regularly. But they have the microphone now. They, they walk in with a different arrogance about themselves. They, they become super spiritual that day. Um, but the week prior to, the month prior to, you couldn't even be on the schedule because you had stuff to do. But now it's your turn. Here's the thing I want you to understand. You, you failed the test. You know why God didn't release another level of glory, why you was ministering, why you was singing? Because your heart is not right. This thing is bigger than being gifted. How humble are you? If, if, when you? if you wait right before the moment to now be, to become humble and now you want to pray now in heaven, that's not how it works. You got to already be praying now in heaven before the opportunity even comes. And so you can tell people that it's not consistent in their relationship right before they got ready, got, get ready to do something. Now they want to go on a fast for three days. Ain't fasted for the last three years. Now they want, now they want to get into the word and study. Ain't studied in the last three years. Because here's the thing, they're worrying about shining and not God being glorified. <laughs> David said, man, it's a, how y'all see this as a light thing? The servants go back to tell Saul what David said. Verse 25, Saul said, watch this, thus shall ye say to David, the king desire not dowry. Watch this, he says, you don't have to give me a dowry because that was a custom that you getting ready to get married, that the man would give a dowry to the father. In other words, paying him off for what he's now going to lack for not having his daughter around. He says, tell David he don't need a dowry, but he can give me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemy. But Saul, watch this, thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistine. So David is before Saul and Saul says, hey, you don't owe me anything. Just go and kill a hundred Philistines for me. But the reason he said that because he really thought David was going to die in the process of killing the Philistines. See, here's why you got to be careful trying to open your own doors because somebody may act something out of you only with the intent to destroy you. See, when God opens the door, what's going to be asked out of you, God has already equipped you to deal with it. Watch this. So in other words, that I tell you I'm going to help you with something, but now you got to spend the weekend with me. That's not God. I'll help you with your car note, but now you got to give up your body. I'll help you with this, but you got to do that. No, no, that's not how it works. That's not God. That's being set up by the enemy. But here's the thing. It says, and when the servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. Wherefore, David arose, and he went, his men, and, and they slew the Philistines, 200 men. And David, watch this, brought the foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, and, and he might be the king's son-in-law, and Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. Here's the next thing that I need you to recognize. Part of the grace that God is releasing it to you is this. You must know how to succeed in the middle of a trap. You must learn how to succeed in the middle of a trap. In other words, here's the thing. Here's what I love about scripture. The, the Bible says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It didn't say it when formed, it just said it when prosper. So in other words, weapon formed against you is a trap. You have to survive being set up only to succeed where others were looking for you to fail. Some people want you to fail. Some people want you to fail so that you can, so they can prove you need them. And so there's somebody that's looking at me now, I want you to recognize this. You wonder, how can this person walk out of my life knowing that we needed two incomes? God allowed them to walk out. They are really looking for you to fail. But here's what I've seen God do with people. I've seen personally where uh, as I grew up seeing somebody walk out of our life and 
a month ago, you couldn't tell me we didn't need their income only to find out that God sustained us even though they left. The truth of the matter is they thought we was going to fail and we were going to need them more to make their ego feel greater, to now they can play both sides of the fence. Because now if you come to me for money, you come to me to get your light bill paid, I can come to you for what I need. So we're going to trade this thing off. And so now they can be having their cake and eat it too. But the truth of the matter is I dare you, I've seen, I'm telling you, I've, I've seen this. I've seen people think that they're more important to you than what they really are. Matter of fact, you thought they were more important. So they left, and watch this, God kept keeping you. That, that, Pastor, I'm, I want to encourage you with something. Your heart is overwhelmed because you found out that one of your greatest givers said that they're going to leave. Here's the thing. Why are you worrying about your greatest giver leaving or not worrying about who gave it to you? If God gave you the church, then it's God who's going to sustain you. He just simply used them for a season. Don't get mad. Don't keep calling them. They, the reason they're not answering you is because they don't want to talk to you. Just accept it for what it is. And you know what has to happen? See, the problem is you begin to change your heart toward them because of what they was doing. He, I heard somebody once t told me this. He said, never have an itch for the rich. In other words, quit watching the books to see who's doing what. Because you might be tempted to start treating people different based upon what they're doing or what they're giving. Here's the thing I need you to understand. That, that you can have one person and what they're doing, he can send you ten other people to make up the difference. But here's the thing that I'm finding out that happens. What God was going to do in that first person, he now do through a hundred. So... It's God that gets it done, sir. It's God that gets it done, ma'am. Here's the thing. You got to look back at yourself and ask yourself this. Man, am I really ready for God to send millionaires in our ministry? At this level, you're not. Because if they do come, guess what you're going to do? You're going you're gonna to call them up and tell them, thus says the Lord. Because now you're trying to win over their heart. And you're going to prophesy to them that God's going to send increase in their life. You're trying to win over their heart because you've done it before. And so the, the thing that you got to recognize is I, I minister to people with, with well, People that mass a lot, they struggle with giving tithes. I'm telling you. See, so, so why you... We're down that person that's giving the ten dollars. Here's the thing: you think this person making ten million is gonna give you a million? No, they they might give you ten thousand, but that's not what was required out of them. And so, from God's eyes, the person that gave the requirement, he looks on them on a different level. But here's the test: they, all of this, they still he could be testing them, but he was testing you too. Notice how your attitude to start changing because you you saw them as a meal ticket instead of God that called you. I'm talking about. Doing that intimate time, the God that you trusted then, now you're going to have to trust him again. You may very well for the next three months, your offering go down, ties go down, people not working, whatever. He getting you back to the place where you trust him to be your sustainer. Can you rely on God? Can you trust him? Can you navigate, and I'm going to go more into this on, on Wednesday, can, can you navigate during the hard times of plenty and lack? Can he pull that out of you? somebody's in that situation right now never have an itch for the rich treat everybody the same according to the grace that he has placed on their life when i mean treating them the same obviously people got different assignments so just like you do with your kids the, the kids was one they get bold enough say well you didn't treat me like this one and it's because y'all are different y'all got different assignments and, and that's another another one all right we'll deal with that one day and so watch this. The Bible declares in verse 28, and Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David. How did Saul know that the Lord was with David? He set traps for him, and David succeeded in the midst of the traps. And Michael, his daughter, loved him. Watch this. Saul thought she was going to be a snare, but she was in love with him. And Saul was yet the more afraid. Watch this. He started fearing David the more, or let's use the phrase respecting him more. And Saul became David's enemy continually. Watch this. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that, watch this, guys, his name was much set by. Notice I showed you before. God never promised you to make you great, but he promised to make your name great. Some of you are going to begin to, your name is going to begin to go out in places that your body has yet to travel. 
And notice what I shared before. First, you, you have to endure your name being a topic of discussion at the dinner table before your name can be the topic of discussion in the boardroom. When God is about to elevate your name, you know that God is about to elevate your name because he pulls out of you the, the, the desire to be recognized or famous. I want to say that again. You know he's about to elevate your name because he pulls out of you the desire to be recognized and famous. See, many people want to be famous before being made. In other words, allowing God to work on them. The problem is that they do get the notoriety, their character can't sustain or their gifts can't sustain the new level or the new place that they are. They are. And so that's how they fall in sin, continue to do things that they were doing before because you really can't handle that. But what has to happen during this transformation, and as we talk about first fruit and God with your attitude, God got to trust the fact that the enemy will set you up with all of these things. And as you're going through the, this level of warfare, it brings humility to your heart. You recognize it's only God that has elevated you because of all of these obstacles that came. And here's the thing. Some people must set up traps against you in order to begin to respect you. They got to talk about you. They got to try to set you up. They, they, Saul tried to set David up in conversation. Tra Saul tried to set David up in front of the Philistines. No matter what trap Saul set, David overcame. Here's the bigger kicker. Neither time did we read that, that David was worried about Saul. He never focused on Saul at all. He, fo he focused more on the God that gave him the opportunity. David kept doing, watch this, guys, We had what he was doing before. You remember we talked about David being in a situation where he was raised by a mother who probably didn't like him because he was a product of an adulterous relationship. Grew up around brothers that probably told him all the time, your mother was this. Your mother was that. She didn't even want you. Could you imagine that little boy going out to herd sheep and only people he around is goats and sheep and God. And he began to find this peace because God became to him what he never had. Somebody I'm talking to now. Are you open to the fact of what you lacked before has simply brought you closer to God? You didn't have a father. So once you recognize God as your father, you you gravitate to him differently than other people. It's because you lack something. And you ran to him to meet those needs for you. And when you look back at it, he's always provided for you. Because he is greater than any human. I'm not saying it's not important to have a father in your life, have a mother in your life. But what I am telling you is there's a God who is greater than any of those people. What I love at the end of this chapter, it says that he handled himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So watch this. David did not catch an attitude with Saul. He did not uh, talk about him behind his back. He did not um, try to set Saul up to take his position. He had already been anointed to be king. And here's something that you got to recognize with the anointing. I don't believe that God gives you more. I believe he unlocks what's already there. So in other words, if, if the, all the anointing you will ever need in your life is already on the inside of you, it just needs to be unlocked. How is it unlocked? It's unlocked through trials, tribulations, circumstances, situations, and it's unlocked through your obedience. So if you go through those things, but you, you, you obey God, it unlocks another level of glory. While Saul was trying to set David up, God was only unlocking no, another level of glory. Here's the thing. If we track David's life, we know what got David in trouble. He stopped believing what he said at the, at the beginning. I'm poor. And a man of lightly esteem, he did start getting caught up in what people were saying about him. He started seeing himself different. So what I want to encourage you as we look at this is handle yourself more wisely than everybody else. You can't get caught up in a circle what everybody else is doing. Your destiny is on the line. Who's coming after you is on the line. I want you to start behaving yourself differently. <laughs> I ran across this. It's not a personal quote that I came up with, but I ran across this, and I said, man, it's amazing. Many people look at growth as acting funny. <laughs> Many people look at growth as acting funny. In other words, when you really start growing, people who are not growing is going to think that you're acting funny. Let that be okay. My destiny is on the line. What God want to do in my life is on the line. 
I don't care who don't like you, who don't want to see you prosper. The only person that can really hold you up at the end of the day is you. If you really take that for what it's worth, you let people be who they are. Let them do their thing. Let me just focus on my attitude. So when I find out that, that this person don't like me, here's what I, my mind should go to. I got to watch my attitude. If I find out that there's a trap being set up against me, you know what I need to think about? I got to watch my attitude. Because we, Scripture proves that if you handle yourself wisely, do what you're supposed to do, the requirement that's inside the Word of God, God will elevate you in spite of. If somebody here right now, God wants to elevate you in spite of. But I promise you, as we went over the last couple times, you got to first root God with your attitude. You got to have a heart of gratitude. I can't give it to you. I can't make you thankful for what God is doing in your life. I can't make you stop complaining. I can't make you stop backbiting. I can't make you stop taking on other people's offenses. I can't, allow, I can't make you not be the trap that the enemy is setting up in somebody's life. I can't make you do those things. All I can do is give you the word of God, and I believe on it, everything on the inside of me. God wants to do something in your life you have yet to see happen before. But it's going to require your obedience is going to require your cooperation to think that God is going to bless you tremendously without you being held accountable is entitlement no you're going to have to make some changes I'm going to have to make some changes I'm going to be tried you're going to be tried all we can do is handle ourselves wisely and guess what I don't know if you're at this place but I'm at this place I can't do that by myself I can't pass these tests by myself Lord I need you don't wait till the test and then ask God to come in spend time with him in the morning before you start your day, first fruit God, get out of bed, get to that quiet place, wherever that may be. Lord, I'm going to spend time in your presence. I don't know what today is going to hold. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want my, my flesh to get in the way. I mean, you know, you, you know what it's like to have that time when you know the enemy is on you. You, 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 you just not feeling it. Here's the thing. You're not rebuking that feeling. You just want to stay in that feeling. I'm just not feeling it that day. Oh, we've been there. But when your destiny is on the line, you can't yield to that. Father, I thank you for your grace. I lift up the heart of those that, that you have allowed to hear this message. Whenever they have opened this video, whenever the season is in their life, I lift up their attitude. Because we need to first root you. If you're going to increase us, you require first fruits. I pray that we can offer you our attitude. Thank you for helping us to see how David handled increase. We see in this part of his life, he was grateful. He was grateful for the opportunity. And I come against in the name of Jesus, the hand of the enemy that is keeping somebody from feeling grateful for the opportunity because they're still waiting on the manifestation. I pray that God will snatch your heart back right now. I pray that you will have this place of dependency. You will really walk in humility, humility dependent upon God. I pray that in this next season of your life, even right now as you're being tested, not focus on the trap that's being set, but focus on the God that gets you through the trap. I pray that God will find success in you while the trap is being set, whether you're being trapped in your conversations or whether you're being trapped to bring 200 four skins of 200 Philistines. Whatever it is, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will pass the test. I, I pray that God will, you will give God no excuse to increase your life. That when he examines your life, that you will be blameless. You will walk, you will be, as the Bible called, perfect, reaching the level of maturity that's expected out of you. And you will handle yourself like you need to handle. But I believe that there's somebody right now, you, you, you don't even have a clue of all that God wants to do. The enemy is just bringing to you what's not right. I promise you, you won't go without, you won't lack anything. That, and I declare in the name of Jesus that God will not withhold any good thing for them who walk upright. I declare right now that every heart that's listening to me that pass every test, that you will not withhold any good thing. You get determined what that good thing is. Lord, I'm open to you. Have your way in my life. Use me as an example to show other people that if they yield to a God as great as you, how many great things can happen in their life. We thank you again for tuning in. I'm Pastor Yaku Shelley, Senior Pastor of the Hand of Lord International, and I count it a privilege and an honor just to have the opportunity to speak to you today. May God continue to bless you, enrich you, empower you, and may you handle yourself wisely in this upcoming season, current season of your life, in Jesus' name. Amen.